without apologies. Um, I want to talk a bit about connected learning, but when we talk, when we think about connected learning or connected teaching, we very often we, we reduce it to sort of technologically connected, and I want to sort of move away from that if possible. If I have one criticism of photography courses, it's in general. They, they, they concentrate on what technology does and very seldom think about what technology means. Um, so, you know, my, my background is as an editorial photographer. I'm, this is, I made a living for the last 20 years making photographs for newspapers and magazines, but crucially, I made photographs. And at some point, those photographs became images. And right now, my, my, my work is almost entirely consumed from screens. Though I made my career making images, making photographs for m papers, magazines. That photographs and images, they're not functional synonyms. And it's really important to, to break those two things apart. I realize this now. So that, when I was asked to write a class for a photography course, for a new photography course that hadn't existed before at Coventry University, I said I'd do it, but um, it had to address this, this um, paradigm shift, this change, this fundamental shift in what it meant to be a photographer. It wasn't appropriate to teach it in the same way that I had learnt it. That would be wrong, because for, for one thing, when things get digitised, images, you know, <laughs> That's a, that's a non-diminishing non resource right there, straight away. The business model doesn't apply in the same way that it did to photographs as it does to images. It's completely different. Couldn't teach the same course. But in, that was what I had to work out. But in order to, to work that out, I had to kind of teach it in a slightly different way. I didn't know how to do it. I'd never taught a class before. But I knew this, this kind of wasn't the right way. I have a question, actually, at this point. This is what I was trying to wrestle with. What is a photographer's product? So what is a photographer's product? I mean, I'm going to, oh, it's not a rhetorical question. I'm going to take an answer. Okay. If photography, well, I okay. So, yeah, it's like a I guess. yeah I, I guess that makes sense. I certainly used to think that photographs were what my product was. They're not. I, you know, I realize now that's one of my products. So when I, when, I, um, when I tried to work this out, it suddenly became apparent, well, in 2009, what I did was I put the class on a blog and I, I crowdsourced the question. I said, what is it to be a 21st century photographer when everyone's an image maker? What is it that makes me different in a room when I'm making images and everybody else is? And I didn't have the answers. But when I opened that out, when I asked other people to help me work this stuff out and then to help the class work this stuff out, there was a, there was a pretty dramatic response. And there was a mixed reaction at my institution. Some people were really positive. Um, you know, I'd actually owned it out for two years when actually the institution sort of realised. Um, but at that moment, the VC was super, super um, supportive, which was great. However, other people weren't necessarily so. And one senior, one senior figure said to me, said, uh, Jonathan, I've, I've given lots of things away in my, in my life for free. And all it's ever taught me is that it stops people wanting to pay for them. Now, at that moment, I, I got it. I got what this person, the, mis the mistake this person was making. They'd got the wrong product. They, hadn't, they didn't know what a teacher's product is. What's a teacher's product? The students, so this person thought that, that the product of a teacher was information. That's what they thought. I used to think it was photographs. So when I saw my images, thinking they were still photographs, out everywhere, I tried to squash them down, make them scarce. It wasn't my value. My value was visual literacy. I could read and write with images when other people couldn't. That was what sets me apart. I understand that now. I understand the value. I understand what it makes, takes to make up an image, that I can pop the lid off an image, that an image is, in fact, nothing more than a data visualization. But at this point, this person thought that information was the teacher's product. And they thought that by giving this stuff away, that, um, that no one was going to come and pay for them. It's that kind of thinking that thinks the, the books in a library, books around us in here, that's the sort of, that's the value asset in a, in, a, in a library, right? But it's not. All that stuff is just information. Unless you've got the librarian in there you, to make sense of it, then, then it, it's, just, it's just chaotic. And that was what I understood. I understood that, in fact, my product as a teacher was this mentored learning experience. That's what my, that's what my, my, um, my product was. And by putting it on a blog, I made it outward facing. I exposed 
this thing, this really exciting moment, when people get really excited, the, the, the best thing about going to university, and I made it outward facing so that anyone could come and see what it was, and that turned it into a touch point. And my class of nine, this is the first year this course had run, nine people in a room, in 10 weeks went to 1,000 people. In 20 weeks, in 20 weeks, just over 10,000 people had come to the class. And in 30 weeks, we had 35,000 people in the class. What had happened, I, by, by opening my class out online, I turned, I turned that class, that learning experience, that really exciting moment, into this touch point where 35,000 people had come along and that's how they dipped in and found, about, found out about this course and found out about the university indirectly. That's more students than go to Coventry University. That's, that's more students than go to NYU. And this is what the class looks like. I talked about images being sort of um, data visualizations. When you pop the lid on an image, there's all sorts of stuff in there that you can read. Um, this here, I, ask, I get the students to, well, we, there were students in the room, they'll tell you all about it. When we, when we have questions, we tweet them, just like we're doing right now. And we have comments, we tweet them. And so, this, this, is, the, this is the tweets visualized from, from Phonar this year. So, that's everybody talking about our class. And that, that dark spot in the middle there, that's, that's a, a room on the ground floor of a converted cinema in Coventry. That's the class. Now, at this point, I'm thinking photography can't be taught that way. You can't do that anymore. It would be morally bereft to teach photography as it had been taught for the last 20 years. Now I think it's, there's no excuse for not teaching this way. When everybody in the room is connected, when every student is connected to, this, uh, to the biggest library in the world, they need the librarian to make sense of it. When every student's connected and the teacher isn't, the class isn't connected? The class is connected? Of course it is. Why isn't the teacher connected? Why aren't they leveraging all of this? So anyway, this here, for me now, if I, well, my kids are going to want to go to, my kids are at school, they're thinking about college, it's a few years ahead of them now. I want to know that their class has this many eyeballs on their work. Think of the compound opportunities for 35,000 sets of eyeballs on your work. The, the, you know, I think the students get this. It's now Guardian's uh, number one photography course. I think it's the first number one that Coventry had uh, this year. It wasn't just down to the classes, there's a whole team of us working on this stuff. That clip that I showed you at the beginning, this is one of my heroes. It's someone that got really excited about this question. What does it mean to be a 21st century photographer? His name was Benjamin Chesterton. He was, um, he was originally a radio, a, a radio producer, I think, for the BBC. He started his own production company. He worked with Dahlia Kamisi to do that piece on the Lebanon for the BBC. Benjamin hires directly from our class now, and he's not the only one. We have people coming to our class in order to see what the students are doing, to watch them grow over that 10 weeks, and then to hire them if possible. Benjamin said, the reason I come, he said, you teach a unique skill set for one. You know, we recognize that um, photographers make pictures for screens and screens come with speakers, so you need to know how about sound. Um, but he also said that the people that take the course are distributed. They're all over the world. So when he's working with Medicine Sans Frontier, he doesn't have to pick someone up in Coventry, he can go and pick them up on location. It was everything, you, you just... We won't listen to that again. So I'm gonna talk about connected courses in a little bit. Brian's gonna nod at me if I run over time. But what we just looked at back there, if you think back to that swarm of, twi of tweets around the class, they are people not in the room. they are people that want to get in the room. they are people that are interested, but it costs 27,000 pounds to get into that room. And I haven't been able yet to break apart that big old one thing in the shop window to break it down. So this summer, with the support of um, UC Irvine, University of California Irvine, and particularly Mimi Ito, um, we rethought how phonar, photography and narrative, it's really visual literacy and digital fluency, reading and writing clearly with images and then being heard. How that could be, um, how that could be built for a t an audience, a specific 12 to 17 year old at risk audience, at risk youth in the US. Um, and so we rewrote it for this audience. And this summer, this, this class, this Phonar Nation, went out to 258,000 
um, 12 to 17 year olds in seven cities in the US. The class can be taught from a mobile phone. It's designed for a mobile user and it can be done with one group sharing one mobile phone. I think that's really interesting because the, some of the best parts about the class were the people that weren't in the room. The kind of the meta class is what we taught them. I had a bunch of students, had a bunch of students who will never ever get to go to university. I had a bunch of single mums, and I'll re I repeat this often. Hopefully one day they'll hear. Who uh, there were three up in the north of England, and they'll never get to go to college. They had kids way too young. But the worst thing was that they thought they, they shouldn't be at college, but they consistently brought another level to the conversation in the classroom. And one of them was by far the best photographer in the group, but they never got to go to university. By breaking this stuff down, we're taking um, that learning opportunity directly out to, to people who, who may not be able to afford it. So this is Connected Courses. Again, this is run by uh, University of California, Irvine, and um, a number of us wrote a series of classes so that people that wanted to open their classes out, people that wanted to connect their teaching, could do this. So this is still running, you can join this, and much like the, the open classes that I've written, it, it can be done asynchronously. There is no particular order that you have to do it in. So if you want to head over to connectedcourses.org or at me afterwards and I'll link you up. It's in the final, final iteration, but I've been running a local iteration of this at Coventry. And it's all Creative Commons license, as all the content is for all the classes that I've written, so that it can be adapted and reused elsewhere. The last thing I was going to talk about is, this is the thing that I think is most exciting, is, is when you open your class out, suddenly the meta class becomes very exciting. And then when you dip out and write stuff specifically to the meta class, for the meta class, then the opportunities just explode all around. What about when we take our class and we kind of infiltrate existing networks? So of the people that were interested in this 21st century photographer question, World Press Photo Award um, plugged in, started retweeting stuff, started answering the questions, offered to find us experts to join the class. Where does that happen? But they also ran an academy. They watched it and they said, oh, we'd like to, you know, how can we, how can we do something like that? And I said, well, what's your academy like? Well, eight to ten people every year win places on our academy. It's kind of putting something back, raising the bar of citizen journalism. How do we do connected teaching? I said, well, the thing about teaching is that it's not a competition, and if it were, then it's the losers that actually need it. Um, and if you're only going to raise the bar eight people at a time, then, then maybe there's a rethink there. But when we, when we flip, well, flipped is the wrong word, because it's not about flipping. When we opened this out, when we connected this course, 11 million people were able to do it in one 12-month period. You can do it as well. It's still running on Facebook right now. And people were able to engage and submit to this course as well. The cost of doing this was zero. This, I think, is the best thing that's come out of, it's not started yet. This is the best thing that's come out of any of, any of the connected teaching and learning experiments and models that I've, had, I've done so far. And the reason why I think that's so exciting is because, you know, the sound's not great, maybe the pictures are, aren't great, great exposure, exposures or whatever. The reason why I think that's exciting is because that was made by a 16-year-old girl who one day hopes to go to university. And she made it on a mobile phone using a torch. When she, when she came for her interview a year later, it was the best portfolio I'd ever seen anywhere. And obviously, I, I gave her a, an unconditional offer to come to study at Coventry. The best bit, though, she got unconditional offers at every single university that she applied for. This, this, does anybody know, does anybody recognize this picture, right? So, can I just have a show of hands if you know what this picture is and what it's about? 
Okay, so two people, no, you're not, Becky, you're not allowed to say anything. Okay, so one person has seen this before and knows what this picture is about. Before you do a Google image search on it, um, if, if that person could just kind of keep that under your hat. Um, this leads us on to the task. This leads us on to our do. The way that the Phonar classes run and uh, my section of the Connected Courses class runs is you have a big complicated concept and then you chip away at it with simplicity. So the big complicated concept for Phonar is what is it to be a 21st century photographer when everyone's an image maker, when everyone's a photographer? That's really tough for a 17 year old to deal with. So we chip away with it and say, right, forget that. What we're going to do now, tell a story from someone else's point of view. Then put your, story, your point of view in there too. That's, you know, that's, we, we start to unpick that. The concept we're going we're gonna to pick out today or play around with is, is this idea that, that, um, that information and meaning don't come bundled together. And that, and that can be quite a head stretch for, um, for, for most of us. It certainly was for me the first time I realized that. So what's, here's the information, what's the meaning of this image? The way we're going to unpick that complicated concept is you're going you're to move around the tables and you're going to do that, have I got news for you, news quiz caption, right? You're going to take a picture and you're going to put a new caption underneath it. But what do people think this picture is about? It'd be great if you could tweet your, your thoughts or responses. I'll give you, give you sort of 30 seconds to... Tweet what you think this image is about. I can't see the Twitter feed, so does anybody want to sort of put their what hashtag? Do you... Hashtag, um, hashtag the, the Think Out Loud Club T O L C and. Uh, if you use Phonar, then the conversation will spill out into the Phonar community as well. P H O N A R. <clears throat> so the title for this image. Okay. The the um. I've been told there's a delay on the, on the tweets coming through, so I'm, hopefully they'll spill through in a minute. The title for this image, very, I mean, I'm not seeing what people are putting up yet, but very often people will put up, oh, it's people doing pictures of the, of the moon, things like this. Um, this is the winner of the World Press Photo Award this year. That's like the Pulitzer Prize for photography, photojournalism. The title for this image is Signal. It's by an amazing photographer called John Stanmayer. These are migrants. These are people waiting to jump into boats to throw themselves into the sea. They're trying to pick up a telephone signal to reach the other side. The, thing that, the problem that I have with this image is because these people are holding up smart devices which are connected to the internet, or could be connected to the internet, and yet it takes a New York Times photographer to travel all the way to tell us this story. When I see this image, this is the meta class. These are the people that aren't in my, in my classroom. The people who can't speak clearly with images or read them and cannot be heard. These are the people that need to be in that meta class. 